Father, we are so grateful to you for uh, this moment that we have to come together to build our life upon that firm foundation. And so as we share together now, Father, bless your word. Give to us the courage to embrace it. Give to us the courage to truly trust you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This past Lord's Day, uh, we uh, focused on this challenge to grow up spiritually, a challenge to spiritual growth. And uh, this morning we pick up on that challenge to move on to maturity and to mature in Christ with uh, a challenge regarding spiritual stagnation. And there is a danger, the danger of becoming stagnant spiritually is, and that is the next focus in Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. I'll not read the passage all at once. I will share with you the first three verses because these first three verses the, addresses the, the goal. This, this is where we want to be. But this is the foundation where we have started. This is where we start, but it's not where we want to remain. We want to move forward and not fall back. We want to move forward with the Lord, to be one with the Lord, and not fail as the Hebrews did after sending the spies in to spy out the land, to look over the land at Kadesh Barnea. We're going to look at this passage together, the danger of spiritual stagnation. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1, therefore let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. If God permits. This we will do if God permits. I ask you to consider with me this, this desire, this will, this passion, this drive that God has for you and me to progress in our spiritual maturity. We are to be progressing in our spiritual maturity. That's the first thing I want you to see. Progressing in faith, that is our goal. And there in, in verses 1 and 2 here, there are three couplets identified. There are six things, six places, areas of, of growth that God desires for you and me. Look at these for just a moment. In verse 2, he, he underscores right out up front that we need to leave, we need to advance from this foundation, the elementary matters of our relationship with God and faith and our spiritual life. We need to advance, we need to grow, we need to mature. In verse 1 he says, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. Could I ask you a question? Are you more mature spiritually today than you were this time a year ago? Are you more mature spiritually today than you were this time one year ago? What has transpired in your life? What have you done personally to nurture spiritual growth in your life? I'm talking about your relationship with the Lord God. I'm speaking about how you serve the purpose, the heart of God. How you advance the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Are you engaged? Are you plugged in? Have you devoted your life to the extent that the people around you who know you, your family, they know Dad is not the same now as he was a year ago. Mom... I don't know what's happened to mom, but she is all about Jesus now. I don't know about my children. I'm amazed at how they have a heart for God and want to be plugged into ministry 
advancing the kingdom of Christ, are you more mature today than you were a year ago today? Are you progressing spiritually? There, the, the, so, so the foundation upon which we start is identified here. This foundation, three couplets, look at, the, at, at verse 1. It says, not laying again, here's the first, the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Friend, that is how we are saved, okay? It's like, you need to settle once and for all your relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you saved or are you not? In the book of Acts, chapter 20, Paul challenging the believers there. He challenged them. He encouraged them to minister, to share, to communicate, to embrace repentance and faith toward God. There are many people who go through crises in their life and they have this epiphany. They have this spiritual revelation, this overwhelming sense that there needs to be a change in their life. And so they, they, they look around, they ponder, how can I change? What do I need to do differently? And so they, they begin this quest of changing the way they live. This personal quest. But friend, if it's not directed toward the Lord Jesus Christ, if it's not directed toward the Lord God, you're wasting your time. You, you, did you know that hell is full of good people? People who intended good. They did wonderful things in life, but they missed first base. They didn't understand that it's only through Jesus Christ that we're saved. And the reason we need a Savior is because our lives are messed up bad, broken, ruined by our choices. It's me. It's not my mama, not my papa, not my brother, not my sister. It's not my neighbor or my school teacher or my boss at work it's me oh Lord standing in the need of forgiveness of my sin life change we're talking repentance turning toward God abandoning abandoning that which is destroying you it's not the stuff out there that's destroying you. It's you and the choices you make. Friend, we can't make right choices apart from the Lord God. Only in Christ do we have the power of the resurrection released in us. It is through Jesus. And so the writer, he begins at this very fundamental level of salvation. He says, repentance from dead works, a dead life, and faith toward God. But then he talks about instruction, about washings or baptisms, your translation may have. It's about the ceremonial rites, the cleansing rites that they were involved with in Judaism. And it talks about, he says, we've got to move on from that. And, and, and coupled with this, about washings, is the laying on of hands. It's about ministry. It's about service. Not only uh, to the body of Christ, but through the body of Christ. It's about ministry. So you get things right about your salvation. You settle that once and for all and you allow the work of the Holy Spirit to bring cleansing to your life to become a daily part of your experience your prayer life and the very first thing you before you don't don't wait until you get out of bed to get on your knees friend before you roll out of bed start asking God to forgive what you dreamed about last night because, well, don't we need it? I mean, think about it. We need God more than we even realize our need for God. So don't wait to get out on your knees. Start before you roll out of bed. You open your eye and say, oh, thank you, Jesus, for another day. Would you start now changing my whole wicked heart? Give me a clean and pure mind. And move forward. Well, and then move into service and ministry. But then he, the third couplet there is about 
uh, is about uh, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. The re end times, eschatological, it's about a 35 cent word, eschatological elements, okay? I don't know. The way inflation hits today, it's probably 55 cents, you know? What a word. What in the world does that word mean? It's a study of end times. The end times. And I can assure you, you are approaching the end times. Both eschatologically, we're talking worldwide, but personally as well, because every day you are one day closer to your departure from this earth. Are you aware of that? I, I, I'm reminded all the time, uh, well, now that I'm in my 60s, I'm reminded every day when I wake up that it's a motivation to prayer of new aches and pains. It's like, what? how did I hurt myself sleeping last night? You know, you wake up sore. It's like you stand up and it's like, do I need to wait before I take a step or what? It's like, some of you are there, aren't you? You know, so I'm feeling good. I'm not alone in this matter. So it's not just God's judgment on me for some unknown sin. But you, you understand what I'm saying. We think about the end times. May I ask you a question? If Jesus Christ returned today, before I finish and extend the invitation for people to come to Jesus, to be saved, to repent of sin, to pour your heart out to God in, 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 in a plea for mercy and healing and guidance and direction, before I extend an invitation for you to come and intercede on behalf of other people who are going through horrible things in their life, before then, if Jesus came, if he came, before the invitation was extended, would you, would you be gone? Well, I would. I would. I'd be gone. And so Brother John is going to finish my sermon for me. <laughs> Forgive me, brother. Forgive me. <laughs> I had to do that because I don't want to leave you hanging, so I got to leave somebody. No, actually, actually, I'll tell you, it, the, I, you want to know how evil and how, how, how ugly my heart is? You know, I'm just going to tell you because you need to pray for me. But I'm sincere about this. You know, I've often thought about end times. Boy, what if the Lord, I would love to be alive and hear. I would love to be preaching. And I'd love, and you know what? Because I would like to, to be left just long enough to tell those who were not resurrected, snatched out, raptured away, I told you so. <laughs> you so I told you he was coming I, that's how that's ugly isn't it that's just ugly I know I know I just wonder what kind of a revival would break out in our Baptist churches if Jesus would just snatch on away the brothers and sisters and leave some of us preachers back to preach I bet there would be some kind of coming to Jesus There'd be multiple services, multiple days of the week. Friend, the point is simply this. The heart of God is that we progress in our spiritual maturity and not become stagnant, stuck where we are. But he goes on. And I'm going to share with you, whether you realize it or not, what is probably the single, I don't know, that it's the single most controversial passage in the Bible. But it is certainly the most controversial passage of Scripture in the book of Hebrews and probably the entire New Testament. And it has to do, well, listen to it, look. Not only do we have here in verses 1, 2, and 3 this firm foundation upon which we start, but, but he tells us the goal, okay? Uh, the goal is spiritual growth. 
It's growth toward maturity. And that's what verse 3 says. He says, and this we will do if God permits. Now, if God permits is a very important condition. Can I ask you a question? Is there anything that God would not permit? Is there ever a time that God would not permit you or me to be released from the curse of our sin? It's a, question, a serious question, and it causes serious controversy among critical scholars. Serious conservative conservative New Testament scholarship struggle with this. And so look at verses 4, 5, and 6, the, three, the, the passage that is so serious. And, and, and here's how I want to approach it. First, I've said verses 1, 2, and 3 are about the, our progressing in faith. Uh, it, it, it's about our goal to progress, to grow, to mature in our faith. But verses three, uh, 4, 5, and 6 address the perils of a stagnant faith. Okay? The perils of a stagnant faith. Not only are we to be progressing in faith, but we have some perils that we need to avoid. Look at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. Mm. When is it impossible to restore one to repentance? Hmm. I want you to hear the testimony of God's Word, both word studies, context, historical usage, the ideology of the passage and the principles, as well as the illustrations from the Old Testament that the writer of Hebrews is pulling together to communicate a very important principle. And it is this. That it is possible for believers, men and women who have been saved, to position themselves beyond God's willingness to restore. Hmm, that sounds serious, doesn't it? Listen to the text. I want you to follow with me here. Look, first of all, at who are facing. Who is it? Who is facing the perils? That are going to that are being communicated. Look, it is a believer. It's believers. It's not apostates. People who uh, there's some of the New Testament scholars will argue that uh, this truth could not possibly be true of believers. Okay, that it would be impossible for them to be restored to repentance. That is forgiven for what the sin that they have committed. That is, God refuses to relinquish or remove the consequence of the choice you have made. When is it impossible? Well, who is it talking about? Some scholars say, no, it has to be people who are in the church who walk, have a form of religion and godliness, but they deny the truth. They've never really been saved, okay? That they are living a lie, that they are just a show, and that when push comes to shove, and when all is revealed, it will be exposed that they never were saved. In 1 John chapter 2, he talks about how they went out from us, 
because they were not of us. Had they been of us, no doubt they would have remained with us. And John is talking about those who had infiltrated the church, but they didn't remain. They left. Why? Because they were never saved. They were just living a hope. They had not embraced their sinfulness and cried out to God for mercy and forgiveness of their sin turning to Jesus Christ, putting their faith and trust in Jesus alone. They hadn't done it. And John says, that's why they left. And so, quote, church members that, well, you know, they were so involved, they taught Sunday school, they did this, they did that, and now where are they? They don't even go to church anymore. What does the scripture say about them? There are two groups of those individuals. And the first are those who were never saved in the beginning. The second group are the ones we're talking about right here. Now, very quickly, let me walk you through this. We're talking about believers, not unbelievers. How do I know? Listen to what the Scripture says. Don't take another person's opinion. What does the Word of God say? And the Word of God says right here in verse 4, look at it with me. He says, for it is impossible. Now, in the case of those who, and he begins to identify, there are five characteristics identified of the people that he's speaking of in this statement. The first is that they have been enlightened. What does that mean? It means the light of Christ has entered. They have been enlightened, illuminated. They have been saved. Jesus is the light of the world. They've received the light of the world. They have been enlightened, okay? Look at the next statement. Not only have they been enlightened, but it says here that they have tasted the heavenly gift. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, okay? They have tasted that gift. They have received the gift of God. Salvation, they've received it. They have tasted that gift. Taste is not, the, the, the same word is used of Jesus at Calvary. And it says he tasted death. Now tell me this. Did Jesus taste it, take a sip, and decide, nah, I don't want it? Or by tasting, did he die? He died. It's all. He not only tasted, he experienced in its fullness death. Otherwise, we would be a people with no hope. Because he would not have been resurrected from the dead. But he tasted death for all of us. He died for all of us. These believers have tasted the gift. And it says, and have received the gift. They've, they've received the light. They've tasted the, the gift. Well, look at it. It goes on further. The third thing, it says, and shared in the Holy Spirit. Now tell me this. Does the Holy Spirit come into a person and dwell a person the moment they believe that they're saved. When a person is saved, when a person believes in Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God comes in. He takes residence in us. He is our seal of salvation. He is that earnest, that promise. The Holy Spirit comes and takes residence within us. He's not, he doesn't remain aloof. He's in you. There's a fourth. Look at the fourth thing here. See, there are five characteristics. It says the fourth thing they have and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God. He's talking about, this, this is someone who not, has not just heard the Word of God. They have received the Word of God. They have believed. They've heard and received. They believed the Word of God. Embraced it. And the fifth characteristic of these individuals is it says that they have tasted the powers of the age to come. That's a reference back to the powers, the miracles, and the uh, healings, and the miracles, and the powers that were displayed from Pentecost, the works of the Holy Spirit. They've seen the work of God, miraculous works, wonderful works, power of God. The power of God has been revealed. These individuals, five characteristics identify these individuals as believers. 
not unbelievers, okay? So let's move to the next step in this, in this understanding. Not only does this text, uh, this passage share with us who is facing these perils, it's the believers, but it also tells us what perils these believers are facing. Indirectly, the audience, the audience has already been given three warnings. Three serious warnings. One about their faith. One about today. Do not turn. If the, if, if the Spirit of God is working on you today, if, if you hear His voice today, do not turn away. Do not reject God when He comes tugging at your heart. Don't do it. You can't be saved anytime you want to. You can only be saved when the Holy Spirit of God draws you. And if the Spirit of God is not drawing at work in your heart, friend, you can't be saved. Salvation is not your uh, of you. It is of God. And when God comes tugging and speaking and convicting, friend, you best pause, listen, Embrace, obey, yield, surrender. My spirit shall not always strive with man. God's word tells us about the people in the days of Noah. My spirit shall not always strive with man, but his days shall be 120 years. And at the end of 120 years, the floods came and mankind, only those who were safe inside the ark of God, were spared. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. 120 years he preached. And you're thinking, I'm preaching about 120 years right now, huh? <laughs> I promise you we're going to get through this fence. Just a few more points here. So, what are the perils? I want you to see these. Well, what, what is it that believers are actually facing here? What, what is going on? Well, I want you to see the, 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 the examples, the context that the whole document, the book of Hebrews, is written in is Numbers chapter 14, Numbers chapter 14, that is the whole point. I take you to Numbers chapter 14. In verse 1, Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night, and all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? The people are rebelling against God. They are at Kadesh Barnea. That is a location from which the 12 spies were sent in to uh, scout out the land. They come back and they have these reports. Ten of the guys, uh, they're, they're just absolutely horrified at the giants in the land. They even said, well, we look like grasshoppers in their sight. I want to tell you something. There's nobody who is in Jesus Christ as a grasshopper. That is a low mentality. You need to think higher, more highly of yourself in Christ than that. Let me tell you, you plus God is a majority. Anybody that's with the Lord is with the majority because God rules. He reigns. But listen to the heart. It goes on down, and I want to share this quickly. Verse 8 of chapter 14. If the Lord, this is, this is <laughs> Caleb, Caleb and Joshua come to Moses and Aaron's defense. And here's what they say. They say, if the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Then all the congregation said, uh, said to stone them with stones. But the glory of the Lord appeared. The only reason Joshua and Caleb were not destroyed right there is that God 
made his presence very obvious. God stole the show. He stole the show. And all of a sudden, the fire and the cloud appeared. The people were like, whoa, what is this? God has a way of getting our attention. And God was trying to say to the people then in this act of rebellion, don't rebel against me. Trust me. I have brought you through out of the land of Egypt. You saw the plagues. You saw the miracles I did there. You saw my power. I took you through a sea on dry ground. I defended you. I defeated your enemy. You stood and watched. I took care of that for you. Why do you not trust me now? No, I haven't brought you to where you are now to leave you and to let the world consume and destroy you. I'm here to declare my name and to advance my purpose of saying to the peoples of the world, there is a God in heaven and he knows where you are and he can deliver you regardless of your circumstance. Yeah, that's where we are, right here in Numbers. But the story goes on, and it is sad. You can read it. And then Moses, he, God says, I'm fed up. That's it. I'm over these people. I will destroy them. I will kill everyone. And Moses throws himself before the Lord, intercedes on behalf of the people, pleads their case. No, Father, you can't do this. Listen, if you, you have brought these people out and the peoples of the world, they have watched and they know they, they, they are amazed at your power. And if you kill all these people, the people of the world are going to say, see, there's nothing to their God. They were following a false God. He's one that led them out and left them and destroyed them. And your name, your name, Father, would not be honored in the world. And God changed his mind. He said, Moses... Because of you and your request, I will spare these people. I will forgive them. And he forgave them. But he did not allow them to enter the promised land. You know where they died? Out there in the desert where they were whining and complaining and murmuring. And the tragedy, the tragedy, I want to sum it up and move on. You can read Psalm 78. But I close this, this focus from Psalm 95. That is a reflection on that same experience at Kadesh. Today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah. As on the day at Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work, for 40 years I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Do you know why so many Christians have no spiritual rest. They are miserable. Life, they wish they could just die. They want to escape. You know, God has offered us a way of escape through Jesus Christ. He has given to us a road map. The blueprints, the owner's manual of your life and mine. And you know what God's saying? If you would do what I've asked you to do, if you would just obey, I've given you, I've laid it out for you. But no, you refuse. You want to do life your way. You're going to do church your way. It's not about surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not about declaring the gospel to the peoples of the world. It's not about me serving other people. I want people to serve me. You're not hearing God clearly. Nor did the people want to hear God clearly. And so he said, I will forgive your sin, but you will die 
in the desert. And I'm asking you, don't die in the desert. Please, don't die in the desert. What perils do these believers face? I'm just going to give you five. They are in danger of losing, and maybe some of you are in danger of losing. First, your opportunity to go on to spiritual maturity by your disobedience, doing life your way, refusing to take your stand with Jesus Christ, identifying with the body of Christ through the church, engaging in meaningful ministry, involved in daily feeding your heart and mind the Word of God, inter and, and engaged in an intimate relationship with Christ through prayer. You're doing it your way. You're not, you're not willing to do God's. You face the danger of losing your opportunity to go on to spiritual maturity. Second, the blessings of God for an obedient life. You're going to lose it. God blesses obedience. He will leave the consequence and the curse of your sin upon you if you refuse to obey. A third, the effective service for Christ in this life. You're going to miss it. You're going to lose it. You will never know the fulfillment that God brings to you for obedience, serving others because you refuse to serve. You sit and soak. You don't serve. In some cases, premature death. That's right. You can choose to consume whatever you want with your body. You can do whatever you want with your body. You can serve God or you can profane the name of God. If you abuse and destroy your body, that's premature death. Let me ask you a question. Now please hear my heart because I'm going to pray over you regardless. Because I want to see God do miracles in your lives. But I ask you a question. Why should I pray for God to heal your body when you have knowingly abused your body? Diabetics consuming carbohydrates and not maintaining their health, doing what they must do to protect their health, consuming alcohol and drugs, Abusing your body, you say, well, a little wine is good for the stomach. Seriously, dude? Seriously. I don't care if you're one beer or six beers drunk. You are on the way to inebriation. You are compromising your mind and you're compromising your witness to those who are looking for an excuse not to embrace Jesus Christ. And they'll use you. They're already using you. You know that gluttony destroys your body, but you continue. You choose buffets, and you have a buffet body, a buffed body. Yeah. Dudes, ladies, seriously? I could go on with many other excuse, uh, excuses that people use, but listen, friend, you're cutting your life short. Why should I pray for God to heal the lungs of a man or a woman who has sucked cigarette smoke in their lungs for 40, 50, 60 years? And for some of our teenagers, it's just a few months, and this jeweling takes their life. It doesn't take long for the enemy to destroy you. I know 
I've got to finish. But I want to say the consequences of what you will lose is here. Think about the families who've been destroyed. Parents who have spent their wealth, everything, and poured their heart out over children addicted to drugs and alcohol who followed dad and mom's example. It is a tragedy. God will forgive you, but he's not going to remove that curse. You'll die in the wilderness. No rest. Not God's rest. Yeah. That's what he's talking about here. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Yeah. So I close with one last thing. There is a potential for blessing or curse in you. That's what the last two verses have to say. Verse 7 and 8 is about a curse or a blessing. I'll just read the text. Listen to it. It says, For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed and, is, and its end is to be burned. In your life, what you choose to do with Jesus and whether you choose to obey the word of God or not determines whether your life will be blessed, useful, a blessing to others, or a curse, useless, to be burned, saved, yet as by fire. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 Verses 10 through 15. Check it out. Let's pray.